Most of us can't understand how it happens. And yet it's reported that three million children are abused every year in the United States. And this tragedy cuts through all financial and racial barriers. The stories you're about to hear may horrify you, but they'll also inspire you. Join Clifton Davis and Patty Cabrera as they explore the hurt and healing from child abuse. I'm Dan Matthews, and this is Lifestyle Magazine. <laughs> Our first guest today is Connie Mercado. She's now the happy mother of three children. But when she was a child, things were anything but happy. Thanks for being here, Connie. My pleasure. I know this isn't always an easy thing to talk about, but we appreciate your being willing to open up mm -hmm. about it. At what age did abuse begin in your life, and who was the abuser? Both my parents were the abusers. My mother was primarily the abuser at first, and it was physical, emotional, mental, verbal. And um, at the age of seven, my father had sexually abused me. Uh, that must have been a very traumatic experience. Now, um, Did you recognize it as abuse right away, or did it reveal itself later on in your behavior? I had no idea what my father had done to me was abuse. I, I assumed it was his way of showing me that he had cared about me and it was, it was pretty traumatic and it wasn't until I reported it that I understood the severity of it. Mm. What is it that changes? What makes you decide, okay, this isn't normal? Um, probably the fear that I had when he was, when he was on top of me and molesting me. Um, just the fear that I had that it didn't feel right inside. Mm. And I went home to the foster home that I was in after the weekend visitation that I was on with him and told my foster sister. You, when you say the fear, but you must have been, that must have been scary too. I was the petrified. Of, of having to actually report your father. Yeah, it was petrified. Did it require a lot, a lot of therapy? I mean, this kind of trauma affects a child for the rest of their lives. Um, you fortunately have been able to do something positive about it by sharing it with the public so that we can be warned, we can be prepared, so that we can know the kinds of things that go on. But how did it affect you in your childhood? Um, it was, I withdrew, I was very quiet and reserved and I didn't really open up and share with anybody until I'd gone to um, Child Help USA where um, they had therapy programs to bring out the problems that I was having inside and learning to deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. Did you find difficulty in relating to other children during that period? Mm -hmm. Not really. Most of the children were like me. They had been in similar situations, some far worse than myself. Um, but I found comfort in, in being around those kids and knowing that I wasn't the only one. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about from what age to what age are we dealing with the abuse started abuse? In my, the abuse started in my family from the age of three up until i was fifteen wow and you said your mother primarily and you said your mother's was mostly physical mental when we talk what are we talking about when we say physical right? my mother for instance would if i didn't get her a beer she took my hand and burned it on a stove and mm. burned off the scar tissue off my hand and wow. that was just for not getting a beer i've been beaten I've had my head beaten on counters for not, for not doing numerous things for, for her. And then it became an issue now. You had both your parents coming in, and, and you're, now your father's introduced a sexual issue. Yeah, it was, that was really the hardest thing. Now how do you relate to your children after this kind of experience? I relate to my children. I take time to think about them first, what their feelings are, how, what they're, in, how they're interpreting me coming off to them. Um, and I, I really take into consideration their feelings more because I know how I felt when, when I was in situations where I would be getting in trouble for probably a petty thing. And I take a lot of time to think, and mommy's the one that takes the time out if I need the time out. What kind of advice would you give to parents today? Because we, we may inadvertently abuse our children psychologically or otherwise. What kind of advice would you give? The best advice that I could give to any parent would be that if you are not in control of the situation, you need to remove yourself from the situation. 
And Does that mean gather your thoughts? Ahead, well, no, it makes me think that we always hear about this, the, the, the cycle as it continues and continues. And I'm wondering, at, have you faced that directly, where you have been a product of an abusive home, and now you have children, and they're doing something to make you very angry, as, you know, little petty things that you mentioned. Every day is a struggle. I will never overcome abuse until I have my children out of my home and they're off on their own. And so every day it's a struggle. If my kids are doing something that I find um, that I can't handle the situation, I remove myself from the situation and place them in their room, and me and my room for us together. Our because so it it's is something you recognize. that you have to address yeah. on a daily basis, but you can overcome. Okay. Listen, there'll be more when we reach. <laughs> Back with Connie Mercado. Connie, what kinds of therapy over at Child Help USA did you find most beneficial in dealing with the uh, abuse problem? Well, they have a lot of programs at Child Help, and a lot of them are therapeutic as far as arts and crafts. There was um, a 4-H club because there's a ranch out there, and I found that most beneficial because I was able to care for the animals and, mm. and kind of love them mm. the way that I hadn't been loved. Maybe you can tell us what Child Help has helped you learn. I would say that Child Help USA opened up a a part of me that helps me to communicate better with my children mm. so that I understand mm. them on their level because that's mm. important. I just think it's terrific that mm. you can take a mm. negative parenting mm. situation and turn it into mm. a positive one. Fantastic. Take your bad foster parenting mm. situation and become a real parent, the kind who exhibits real, caring, mm. nurturing qualities to your mm. child. I mean, I guess it's a very important thing for you to cut that, to break that cycle mm. of abuse, isn't it? It's, it's probably the most, other than having mm. my children, the happiest mm. thing that I've ever experienced and, in my and life. And we're talking about natural parents, abuse from natural parents, and then going to foster homes and getting abuse from the, the parents from the yeah. in your foster homes. Were you ever afraid that, that the cycle would continue? Every day. I mean, when you, when you were pregnant with your first child, were you afraid that... You might abuse that mm. child? Every day of my life, I face that fear. And when I wake up my children and I look at them in their eyes, I know that it's a struggle and that it will be a struggle for me today, tomorrow, and forever. And, and brothers and sisters you have? Yes, I have a brother and sister, and they, um, they all live back east. And How was that growing up? Were they, were they also abused? They were, also, they were abused if... I, I primarily made sure that if my mother was upset, that she had me to take it out on. Mm. The times that I wasn't there with my brother and my sister, they had some abuse, not, mm. nothing as severe as mine. So you were kind of a caretaker, and you kind of put yourself in mm. between as a barrier Sacrifice. between your, 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 your parents and uh, your siblings. My siblings, yes, I did. Mm. Well, now here you're an adult. You're a mother mm. of uh, three. And doing well. And doing well. Yes. What do you say to those parents who are survivors of abuse? How should they cope? What kind of skills? Is there something you want to say? The only thing that I could say that I think would benefit anybody is to take what you have, apply it to your life, and move forward. Mm. And not to dwell on the past. Not to dwell on the past. Well, I guess that's easy to say if you've come to grips with it. If you've faced it and you've come found a way to cope, what about that person who hasn't quite coped with it, who's just recognizing, right out here, who's just recognizing that they've got a problem underneath them? How would you help them right now? The first thing, by them just acknowledging that they might have a problem, that's the first step. Um, and then them going for, forward from there to find programs that might be beneficial to them. Um, Child Help has an 800 number that anybody can call and get free information on their, on their 800 number. They'll send you books, literature, whatever information you need. And just knowing that you have a problem, that there might be a problem there, is that's acknowledgement enough that you should do something. You feel like you've overcome it now? Not yet. Every day is a struggle, but every day that I don't lay a hand on my on my on my children is a is a day that i've gone 
that I've that I've made it. I've well, we're going to come back and mm. talk more about this. And when we come back, we'll talk to someone we think of as a real hero around here. He's mm. been helping kids heal from child abuse for years. Mm. My biological father um, got out of prison and kidnapped a 13-year-old girl in Puerto Rico, who he kept locked up for a year. And and the result. Uh, she died of childbirth because she was undernourished, and so was I. And welcome back. Bill Steiner is the National Director for Child Help USA. For 40 years, he's been working to help heal kids who have been abused. And also joining us is Felix Santiago who was a victim of child abuse for most of his early life. Felix, Bill, thanks for being with us. Felix, I'm really anxious to get into your story, particularly because of the way you've overcome. Tell us a little bit about that childhood. Well, to begin with, I am the product of a rape. My biological father um, got out of prison and kidnapped a 13-year-old girl in Puerto Rico, who he kept locked up for a year. and. And the result, uh, she died of childbirth because she was undernourished, and so was I. Hold on a second. <clears throat> he kept her a prisoner for the whole first year that he had kidnapped her, 13 right. year old girl. Right. And during that year, you were born. Actually, he got scared when, he, when she was about to give birth, yes. so I guess he threatened her and took her to the doctors, and that's when he got arrested. And I was born, my mom died. And the, my custody was given to the Department of Social Service after I got out of an uh, incubator because I was undernourished as well. The Department of Social Services took over because my father was incarcerated at that time, charged with murder one, rape, and attempted to murder mm. me. Mm. Now that wasn't the, some of the, that's where it began. Right. But you had some worse stuff. Right happen after that. Tell us about that. Well, my supervision was placed under the custody of a child abuser. My foster mother was a uh, child, uh, being a child abuse, abuser for a long time. She has been abused herself. And um, uh, when I was about eight years old, I, I realized that something was wrong in my family. This is what happens. My mom was, um, she, um, tied me up to a chair when I was about eight years old, tattooed her name to my back, and gave me a shot of cocaine. Bill, does this happen often? Uh, it happens more often than we would like to think. You know, as been indicated, there's more than three million reported cases of child abuse and neglect in the country a year, and about a half a million children can't live with their own parents and have to be removed by the courts. Well, it's just a frightening thing to think of. I, being a parent <clears throat> myself, I. You know, yeah, I discipline my kids, but I can't imagine tying my child up and, and administering drugs to them. Life is so short. Unfortunately, our time is running short, too. Mm. There's so much to this story, so much I want to hear from you. Tell me, what happened? How did you get into prison? Well, after the abuse at home, it was, uh, that happened for a period of years. When I was about 13 years old, my mother started talking to me about how I, I admire her in some sort of a way because she was a savage on the streets and people on the streets respected her a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, I admired that side of her. And although I had to endure a lot of uh, beatings and sexual abuse from her, I also, there was a side of me that loved her a lot. Now, this is a fascinating dichotomy to me. That is a really interesting thing. A part of you wants to love, a part of you wants to hate. Hey, we'll examine this issue and more when we come back. There was an incident when somebody got stabbed and killed, and um, I realized that at that moment that I didn't want to end up like that. And I asked God to take over my life, and, and he did. I'm talking with Felix Santiago. Felix, how, how much time did you do in prison? Um, I did three years in New York State first, and then I did seven years for California State. Well, I'm anxious to get to the other side of the story. Um, the reason that you're out today talking about it on, on our show. 
Um, what happened to you in prison, very quickly? Well, um, there was an incident when somebody got stabbed and killed, and um, I realized that at that moment that I didn't want to end up like that. And I asked God to take over my life, and, and he did. Uh, today, I attend a college, uh, Christian University, Pacific Union College. I talk to people, young kids that are involved in gangs and have been experiencing child abuse themselves and drug addicts. And I try to um, tell them that there is hope, that people don't have to settle for drug abuse or, or for living a life of pain simply because we've been abused before there is still hope and there is a God that listens and cares and, mm. and there's people that care and that somebody's out there to help. Mm. That is just awesome to me. Bill, tell me, do you see this kind of thing? Do you see lives changed after Child Help USA has come into play? I think if I didn't see lives change for the positive and see survivors like Felix and Connie, you couldn't do this work every single day. Obviously, Child Help USA with addressing children's psychological needs, emotional, spiritual, and educational needs works to turn these children around, to build their self-esteem, mm. to give them hope for the future, to give them good role models mm. that will teach them that life doesn't have to always be violent and abusive, that they can have a good life for their future. I'm just curious, Bill, and actually, make let me say, what is it that you could say specifically if someone were listening and saying they're dealing with all these different issues how do they know that they themselves are valued when they've been beat all their lives what do you tell them well the child and the adult as they're growing up has to feel inside that they're valued and that they're okay and that they're not responsible for the abuse that they were subjected to which you would tell them what you'd need to tell them that they're that they they can't undo what happened to them in the past mm. but they can direct their future mm. and that there are adults around that will help them they're not alone, they're not isolated, there's resources in the community right. all across America so that they have really a lot of support in bringing their life to a happy ending and, and, and a, a positive uh, view. Compassionate people around them, people to support them. And Child Help USA has a national child abuse hotline 1-800-4-A-CHILD where we have crisis counselors mm. every single day, 24 hours a day that's available for people to call that hotline number to not try to do all this by themselves, not only children, but also parents and survivors of abuse and neglect mm. that have a resource throughout the country mm. and many good model programs mm. to teach good parenting skills. How important is it, very, very quickly to close, how important is it for us to role model before our children? These children that we work with have to have good role models, have to have mentors that will show them that all adults are not abusive, all adults mm. are not exploitive. Mm -hmm. It's critically important. And there are lots of folks out there. There's the faith-based community, there's character-building organizations, boys and girls clubs, coaches and teachers, all that want to do that for children. And it's because of that that young people who change their lives, like Felix, can make a difference in other lives. And like Connie, like Connie, thank you for being with us. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> I'm sure lots of your hearts, like mine, are weeping right now at the stories that have been unfolded on this program. But we're so grateful there is hope and uh, Connie, Felix, I, I'm sure there's a boy and a girl watching this program right now. You had one thing you could say to them, Connie. Tell them, and you too, Felix. I would just say that you're not alone, that you fight for, for yourself and, and never lose sight of who you are. Mm -hmm. I'll say that I found healing in believing, believing in myself. And if you can believe in yourself, you can forgive and you can forget yeah. and you can go on. Mm. And your organization, mm. Bill, is there to help? Absolutely. A phone number? Child Help USA, 1-800-4-A-CHILD. We're there to help. Mm -hmm. And if you are one of those people who may need help right now, that's the phone number. And thank you for being with us on Lifestyle Magazine. Thank mm -hmm. all of you for being here. Thank and you. we'll be here next time. Bye now. <laughs>